Well, praise the Lord, everyone. It is so good to be here on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Um, Myra and I have uh, made it a habit over the past few weeks to um, go to uh, services in the morning and then uh, have lunch date. So we had another well, another wonderful lunch date, a uh, different place than we normally go to. Had a great time. And I think uh, both of us had a chance to actually take a quick little nap yeah. so that we could be uh, <laughs> nice and fresh for you guys here at the five o'clock hour on the East Coast. So without further ado, because we have a lot to talk about today, I, kn I know I do. Um, so we're not going to prolong things. I'm going to ask my darling wife uh, to uh, open us up in prayer, and then she can just share what uh, thus saith the Lord uh, for today. Remember, our title for today is We're Celebrating Independence Day, but are you free? All right. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for every occasion you give us to share the word. And we pray with each opportunity that we share the word of truth, not our truth, but your truth. We bless you, Lord. We praise you. We honor you with all that we are. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Amen. I'm going to start with John 8, 31. Um, I'm just going to do 31 because 31, 32, because I know I think my husband's going to really elaborate on the rest of it. But then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The first thing we need to note is he said, Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. He's not talking to unbelievers. He's, he's talking to a group of people who have come to follow him and believe that he is the Christ. And that's the most important thing because you can't say that your lifestyle is based on Christian principles if you don't believe in them, that you are a righteous person if you're not a Christian. So he's talking to us and that's very important because you know, there's so much conversation about what is true and what is not true. But the truth shall make you free. And it's his truth. It's not our truth. It's his. But there's, there's some principles that we need to follow in order to stand in that. And then when I say stand, it, go, it takes me to Galatians 5.1, which says, Stand fast, th therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. And I was thinking a little bit about uh, slavery in the United States, because I can't speak of slavery any other place. But when our people were set free, I've been reading different stories about uh, heritage lately. And there were stories that some people didn't even leave the plantation because they didn't know what to do. Mm. They just stayed there. Others did go off and, and make a life of their own, but some of them stayed because that's all they knew. It was the yoke of bondage. That's what they were used to. In their actions, they didn't actually feel like they were free, but they felt like, well, I don't have any security. And, you know, we hear stories that, you know, they knew the Lord and all that, but do they really know God to to have that freedom to say, well, I am truly free, not only in my body, but I'm free in my spirit. So let me go and, and see what God has for me. And that's kind of sad, but that's just a picture because we as Christians are just like people in bondage because we have that bondage to ourselves. It's, it's not the bondage of, of shackles and a, a, like you're in prison and the doors locked with a key. If somebody doesn't lock that door and you're still in that prison cell, and the only thing you have to do is push the door open, but you just believe that you're still in bondage. If you 
walking that way, thinking that way, mostly thinking that way, because that's that represents how you walk, how we walk, then you're not truly free. Romans 8, 12 says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors. And that's important. We need mm. to understand what, why we should have this freedom. Understand it, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God, because we belong to Him. And being led by the Spirit, which means not just saying I'm a Christian and I'm a child of God, but that needs to be walked out. It should be evident, because we're being by the led by the Spirit, and the Spirit of God is good. So there should be no. Uh, appearance of evil within us that there's no appearance of jealousy no appearance all the things that we say well I'm just human but if you're being led by the spirit you can say no I'm, I'm not caught up in that yoke of bondage I know how my flesh wants to dominate because that's what the word says for as many as led by the spirit of God these are sons of God for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. Now it says fear, but when you have fear, you're afraid of many things. It's not just, oh, I'm walking around in fear, but you have fear of people like me. Uh, what should I do for them? What, you know, it's, it's not a question of who I am. It's a question of how do I react because I'm in fear. And it's not fear of God, it's fear of others. But you have we have received the spirit of adoption by whom we call out Abba Father Daddy help me I know you're there for me so I can walk in a different way the spirit himself himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God and if children then heirs heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ if indeed we suffer with him that we may also be glorified together. It's not an easy path, but it's a glorious path because that flesh is very strong. You can't always blame it on the devil. It's our inner man that needs to be transformed and changed to be like the image of Jesus Christ. Galatians 5.13 says, You, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. He says, I'm a Christian, so I, I have all these privileges, and God is with me. And, and I remember years ago, I don't know if they still say this, people, Christians, name it and claim it. Well, God, you said that I can have this and I can have that. And it's mostly material stuff. <laughs> Doesn't say anything, but thank you, God, for this bread, this daily bread that you have given me. No. I want a husband, I want a car, I want a house. You, I'm going like, to name it and claim it. But it doesn't say that. Only do not use liberty as opportunity for the flesh, because that's, that's what you're feeding. That's what we're feeding. But through love, serve one another. Look for ways to demonstrate the, the, the Christ-like in us. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a sacrifice. Because sometimes my neighbor is not very friendly. Sometimes they, they get on our nerves. And it's just not our neighbor next door. It's the people that we interact with on our jobs, in our churches, in our community, in our families. But you should love your neighbors yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. And that's not God's purpose to give us liberty. We're walking in the spirit it says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. You say, oh, I want to be good today. I want to, I want to, you know, be like Christ. And then something comes up, and you're like, oh, mess up. But you have to kill that flesh. And that's a, that's a work. 
But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So every day, where is the Lord? He should be with us if we are truly followers of him. If we declared him, he is with us. So we need to have that communion, not just reading the word, but daily spending time with him in, in our everyday walk. I heard something this morning, which is really sweet, on one of the um, programs I was listening to. I think it was, it was Huber. It was uh, Connie. Uh, Pastor Connie was talking, and he was saying, you know, sometimes we talk about all these things that we have and all this, thank you, God, for this. And he says, just getting up in the morning and saying, thank you. Going out during the day and just say, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you. Just through the day, just being grateful. Not for things, but just for his presence. Thank you for, my husband says sometimes, thank you for the unseen harm that could have befallen us this day. In our car, as we walking down the street, you could tumble, fall. Being thankful of things you don't even see. But knowing that God is with us. Philippians 2 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Mm. The mind of Christ? Mm. Who, be it in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death even the death of the cross for us, for our sake, that Christ would be the deliverer because of the love of God for each and every one of us. And some of us will never do that. But there are others who are still striving and looking, and he is to be found. We go back to Isaiah 53, which is so beautiful. Part of it says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, as Jesus, grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we have, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's Old Testament. Because we are now free. We have liberty in Christ. But are we demonstrating that in our lives? Because it's not, I'm, I'm saved and that's it. No. We're growing in Christ. We come just as we are. He doesn't say, get this right, get all your ducks in a row before hmm. you come. We come with a whole lot of baggage. But that baggage doesn't have to keep weighing us down. That baggage should daily be cast off and thrown into the pit of forgetfulness. And we should be developing into a new man. People should see that in each of us. We should not be tossed and turned by these things in the world. And there's a lot of things going on in the world. But if you read your Bible, you know what these things are. It's just a sign of the times. But the, we should rejoice in what is coming. And it's him who's coming back to his people to bring them to with, be with him forever. And how are we going to be looking when he comes? Are we going to be angry about this happening, that happening, people doing this and people doing that? Or are we going to be representing the love of Christ that says, God loves you and I love you. And my desire is that you would come to know him. In the Bible, it says, pray for those in leadership. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for those 
who aren't kind to you. It doesn't say curse them. It doesn't say talk about them. It says pray for them because you don't know what your prayers could do. You don't know what they need to hear. So when we give back kindness to someone, it says if someone smacks you on the one cheek, you give them the other. Someone asks you for a cloak, you give them two. He says, ah, oh, but no, I don't, I can't do that. But it's, it's not literally saying that, but you could. Some people do that. So we were, we were going somewhere this morning. We were dropping off our son, and he had kind of spoken in my ear that he was going to walk. He liked walking, but I don't think my husband heard it. So he, he was going to take him to the place, which was going to take us a little bit out of our way. But that's what, that was kindness. That was kindness. He didn't have to do that, but that's what's it, what was in his heart. And we were going that way for him. But my son said, you know, I need to walk. It gives me time to think and contemplate on the Lord. So I let him know that he wanted to walk so he could spend more time with the Lord. But the kindness that was displayed in a little, I mean, you say that's nothing, but it is something because it's displaying the heart of Christ. It's displaying the heart of God. And we have the Holy Spirit within us, so we should be displaying Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within us. We have it all. We have everything. And we should not be sheep who have gone astray because that shouldn't be us. No one should say that about us. We're not ones who have gone to our own way because the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all and we are saved. We are the demonstration of the love of Christ in this earth. We are not walking in sin. Only in our mind can we just change that. I am not a sinner. I do mess up. But Christ has called me saved. He has called us saved. He has called us saints. And when we get that in our minds, not just in my heart, oh, when I'm praying, I know I'm a saint. I know God loves me. I know this. But then in our mind it says, oh, no, well, I'm only human. I'm going to mess up. Yeah, you are. we are going to mess up. We keep saying it. But as long as we believe and understand that we have been saved once and for all, he died once and for all for us, that's the liberty that we have in Christ. But don't use it against others to do and be whatever we want to be and treat people out of the way that God would want us to treat them. It should be a part of ourselves because he is a part of ourselves. But we have to fight against that flesh and understand that that flesh does not have dominion. That flesh die, can die daily, but the Spirit of God can dominate over everything and within us that is not like him. And that's the liberty because it says that the Spirit gives us liberty. We are free in Christ Jesus. And we need to understand that with everything. I, just, I, I do these words and Matt goes like, <laughs> with every fiber of our being. <laughs> because he is in every part of us, in our DNA. Mm -hmm. He is... He is the, the author and the finisher of our faith. He has created us in, we, in his own image. I don't look like him physically. Mac doesn't look, but the spirit is him within us, and it looks like him. It speaks like him. It talks like him. It walks like him, and we only have to allow it the liberty to overcome the thoughts of our minds and the weakness weaknesses of us the way we think and the way we look at things the way we act to things we should be the epitome of a Christ in this earth we are not him but we are sons and daughters of his who is your father who is teaching us who is laying before us the groundwork for us 
to walk the path that will bless him and bless others with the liberty and the truth that is found in Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You know, um, Myra, before I even get into what I'm going to share, um, I want to thank you for reiterating that we're going to make mistakes in this life. Mm -hmm. We already have and we will continue to make mistakes. I think that the greater lesson, and that's where I, I hear you talking about this freedom, is that when Jesus died on the cross to atone for our sins, they were for all the sins. Mm -hmm. That, that, that's for what we'll ever do in this natural life. It, it doesn't give us license to just be willy-nilly and just, mm -hmm. you know, just be off the chain and, 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 and just sinful just for the sake of being <laughs> sinful. That's a whole different um, avenue. But we will make mistakes in this life. And that's the blessed assurance that we have mm -hmm. that the sins that we commit have been atoned for. And, and the last thing that I like what you said is that how God identifies us. And when you look over the expanse of the new covenant, New Testament, um, you see the language changes. You see that sin is talked about for the believer. Mm -hmm. Sin is talked about in the past tense. Mm -hmm. And we are identified, as she said, we, we're seen as saints, sons and daughters, children, bride. We, we see a different vernacular come into place and, and that is the, the liberty and, and, and freedom that no man can take mm -hmm. away from you. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's taken away, it's because of lack of understanding, ignorance even, that you would allow a system, a person, mm -hmm. or an entity to take away the freedoms and liberty that God has given us through Christ to me, that's the whole beauty of what we call Christianity or call being followers of the way is that mm. <laughs> we're not just at liberty to do what we want to do because in actuality, we should be dead to what we right. want to do and we should be alive in him and operate as he wants us to operate and that's the freedom because you don't have to worry about systems and you know, this is perfectly leading into <laughs> what i'm going to talk about we 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 get so caught up in semantics that we forget that honestly you don't need to go to a building to have someone that you might call a pastor or an elder that person uh, is not the one. He's not. Mm -hmm. He is not the one who controls things in your life. God has been trying to get us to understand that His way is through what we would call the theocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the theocracy can be defined in worldly. Uh, stand uh, by worldly standards, but can also be defined the way I like to de define what that means. And that just simply means is that God ultimately is our government. God is our mm -hmm. holy leader. Mm -hmm. Christ is our high priest. And so, you know, 
yes, does Romans encourage us to be mindful of the leadership on this earth? Absolutely, mm -hmm. I'm not taking anything away, but you know, when we get to a place where there has to be a, a decision made, do we make it based upon what the world standard is, or do we make it based upon God's standards? Mm -hmm. That that honestly, darling, is the the <laughs> perfect lead in. Oh, I was wondering how we we're gonna lead into this. And and I thank you that you use a different aspect of the slave mentality, so to speak, into a mentality of freedom. And I'm gonna go in a slightly different direction, amazingly, using the same scriptures. Right. <laughs> um, and that's the beauty of what we do here. You know, we sit here and we don't carbon copy uh, how we share. And I don't monitor what she's going to say, and nor does she monitor what I'm going to say. So I want to lead off in that, once again, um, I had thought about just continuing on talking about music and um, I'm not going to put that on the shelf as of yet. I'm thinking about actually just really breaking that out into something I do outside of this format because there's some things that I really want to share that I don't feel work within this Sunday platform that we've created. Um, and so I think I'm going to go in, in that direction. I'm, I'm really... Uh, seeking the Lord's counsel on that. And I didn't think it was uh, by happenstance that last week Myra couldn't actually participate, you know, um, because I don't think it's really our kind of topic. But um, I was thinking about it as Thursday, this past Thursday, uh, we had families and a nation, the United States, Mm -hmm. celebrating liberty, uh, at least what is supposed to be liberty, and uh, Independence Day. Mm -hmm. And it made me think about our country. So for our global listeners, this might be a little more uh, inclusive of what's happening in the U.S., what I'm going to share anyway. But there's always a, a bigger lesson that can touch every part of the globe. But... In the grand scheme of things, the United States is the baby of the world. You know, we were we were sitting there talking about it, like the the um, uh, date for independence <laughs> historically is seventeen seventy six. All right, uh, and and so that means that our little nation is not even two hundred and fifty years old yet. And, and, and I still try to grasp that, are we that young? Like, like when we talk about the other nations around the globe that have been around for centuries, even Myra jokingly said, oh, we've been around at least a thousand years, right? And I said, no, no, what are you talking about? No, 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 I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible that God allowed for the United States for so many years to prosper, yet we are mm -hmm. infants. We, 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 we're literally still in diapers by the uh, standards of time, uh, at least human time. So it got me thinking... Um, what is it that we are actually independent from? I, I guess historically, we would say that this was to separate uh, ourselves as a nation from Great Britain, uh, which is now the United Kingdom. Um, but what does that really mean in historical uh, accounts where 
we came over, and I'm saying we liberally. <laughs> <laughs> hit, hit, hit. But let's just say the uh, inhabitants of this country uh, that came from Great Britain, they came to a land that was already fully occupied and literally uh, created their own atrocity by basically enslaving the natives who were already there and putting them into a whole other kind of bondage, which in some ways I think is worse than what the uh, black Americans have experienced. Anyway, I'm not even going into that as far as our topic today, but I'm just trying to set the standard that uh, the Constitution, United States Constitution, the Bill of Rights, <coughs> bless you, and the Declaration of Independence. Those are what they call the Freedom Charters or Freedom Documents. And I'm going to say this again because I've said this in many other episodes prior. We understand that those documents were created and signed by men who probably weren't even true believers as we understand true believers today, but even they understood that the foundation of a government, bless you, um, had to be under an authority that was greater than them. And that's the, the real important lesson to, to learn here. And so as we talk about what's going on today, as far as the upcoming election, as a, uh, according to, uh, you know, just the political atmosphere, the governmental atmosphere, the social atmosphere, even the spiritual atmosphere, we have fallen into a place where we have prioritized human government over God's government. We can always go back in scripture to uh, when the people were crying out for a king and God was pleading that he be the king, he be the priest, he would be the one who would rule over the people and this would be the children of Israel. He would be their leader, but the people were crying out. They, they wanted to have a, a human being in place who would be the leader. And we know that that actually changed the system that God had put in place because before that system came into place, God had established judges, you know, and even though that system was imperfect, you know, even the judges were uh, men and one woman who were placed by God to basically be his mouthpiece. But then you bring in a system where you have one person to rule, and we know historically that has never worked because no one can be God. No one can be Christ. And, and so there are always going to be flaws in any kind of leadership. And when there are flaws in leadership, ultimately that hinders freedom. And so 
what's going on currently, the two things that are happening, one of them, because Myra was uh, quizzing me uh, this weekend about mm. this, and that would be Project 2025. And to just give a quick synopsis of that, because I, I didn't even really think I was gonna talk about this at all. But Project 2025 is basically a, a system that's uh, spearheaded by a contingent of conservatives uh, through the Heritage Foundation to establish policies in our country that will make things more conservative. You know, whether that's something that will ultimately work, and I, I would say it will not work, um, uh, we need to understand what's going on because people are maneuvering in order to recreate the original charters of freedom that made this country what it is okay but also what is happening is is that there's another system that is come into play which is called uh christian nationalism and and that one is a, a little bit more scary to me mm -hmm. because ultimately with that system and let me tell you what that system is um that system, Christian nationalism, is a system where you take a, a group of people and they uh, make claims that their nationality places them under Jesus Christ's favor and blessing and denies mm -hmm. gospel truth. What, what, let me better explain this because I'm looking at my notes, but I, I think I better just say it off uh, out of my heart as opposed to my notes. Basically, what Christian nationalism does is it puts man's government on the same level as God's principles and God's commands and God's statutes. So, it's not just about being a Christian who loves their country, but it's about putting them on the same level so that you could have a particular candidate that we know of that can create a, a Bible that also includes the Constitution, the U.S. Constitution in it. That is not how it's supposed to work. Um, and in fact, if I can be transparent, um, God probably has a good laugh over mm -hmm. the current systems that we have that even define how our government is established by uh, Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, whatever you want to mm -hmm. call these uh, particular pockets of people. Because God doesn't operate in these systems nor does he operate in the government of the current church, which is governed by either a particular belief system, be it uh, Calvinism or Arminianism, mm -hmm. or uh, talking about denominational uh, pursuits and doctrines such as Episcopalian, Baptist, Lutheran, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you don't find these things in scripture. So if you don't find them in scripture, then man has made them. And I'm saying all this because there's a, a, a greater point. All of these things that man creates puts mankind in bondage because we, we are doing things outside of the uh, constraints, if that's the word, of the Bible. And that is a dangerous place to be because that doesn't include God 
in our lives and that doesn't make him the principal person when 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 so-called believers can divide over a political party or have questions to whether you should be pro-life or pro-choice if that's your argument then you're in bondage because God is above all of those things. Those things are minutia. If you understand God, you don't see it. If you please anyone, if you find in scripture where God is operating and allowing things according to his perfect will that look like what we're doing with it, then please, please show me show Myra and I will change everything that I'm saying right now. However, you know, because we do owe allegiance to the leadership in this world, we all have to be a part of it to a point. The point is however are we about the party that we re uh, supposedly represent mm -hmm. or are we about the god that we're supposed to represent do we uh promote leaders that actually share biblical foundational truths that we can be confident in or do we just support someone because maybe they're a little sharper ment mentally than the other or because one is a different shade more like maybe mine than the other how are we making decisions that ultimately affect what's going to happen to our children and their children and their children's children. And we come up with some very, very, very uh, minute ways of looking at our decision-making process. And I don't hear God in any of these things that get shared. And I'm going way off script here, um, but I'm going to bring it into the foundational text that we have for today. And that was in John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. I'm going to read that right now. And I will tell you as well, it would be really good to have a healthy understanding of John chapter 6 and 7 as well. And I'm going to touch at least a lot in John chapter 7. Okay, but let me read this for you. Starting at verse 31 of chapter 8 of John, and I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And I put that as the foundational scripture because, oh my gosh, it so reminds me of what's taking place in our world right now. So if you understand anything about the scriptures, 
The moment somebody says that we are descendants of Abraham, what they are saying to you, uh, number one, they are uh, the children of Israel. They, they go under the law, okay? They, they have, uh, have an understanding of the, the Torah. They, they, they know about uh, the, you know, the five books of the law, uh, the law of Moses. And it's through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that is where their belief system is, and it has not strayed from that. So anybody that says anything outside of that trilogy of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, they are going to be not received well. Well, that's the whole purpose of Jesus Christ coming on the scene. We talk about it all the time, he being the fulfillment of this law, okay? But I don't know if we actually understand how many of us are still in our own ways descendants of Abraham in the way that we think. I would, I would put it under the marker of tradition. This is the way we've always done it. The way that we worship, the way that we have what you guys call church. Okay, that's still part of a system. And so when you are tied into that system and, and can't see anything around that system, then I would argue that you are in bondage because if it's not working within the law, then you can't see that there's actually something that's outside of it that does not compete with that law. It actually adds grace and mercy to that law because that law cannot be lived perfectly by any human being. Why? Because it's God's law. There's nothing wrong with the law in and of itself if you think you're God and if you think you could actually be perfect in the way that God is perfect. Heaven forbid. Okay? So, so, God understood this. He gave us the parameters because of sin. We would have never had to maybe even have this whole conversation of old covenant, new covenant, but for sin. Sin changed the dynamic of everything according to our human existence, and it put us on the outskirts of God's provision and only by being uh, or, or, or coming to an understanding that we need salvation, that we need to be delivered from our own wickedness, only then can we actually see that over on this other side, in this new covenant, of this new fulfillment of this uh, atmosphere of grace. It doesn't negate the law of the old, but it, it, it is the mechanism that God has used to allow for us to realize that we have fallen short of his glory, but that we can now be a royal priesthood in his presence and on this earth. And I'm going way off script um, with what I have on my little cheat sheet here. But it's important, the reason that I picked this particular portion of scripture is because the people that were before Jesus, now remember this is before the cross, 
All of this is before the cross, so we are dealing with the children of Israel. We are dealing with those who were practicers of the law. That's what they knew, all right? Even though the prophets had foretold of this coming Messiah, they had not gotten to the point of understanding that Messiah was there in the form of Jesus. And Jesus, you got to know, and I'm going to tell you this uh, right now, uh, everyone, that if you are listening to people that don't challenge the where you are, then I, I think that you need to find a, a new source, a new resource, because the word is to challenge us. The word is to grow us. The word is to, to not just let us be comfortable where we are, but we're supposed to always be transforming. Transforming is present tense. We, we're transforming at all times into the, the perfectness that we should have been from the very beginning. It's all about reconciliation back to our father, to have that relationship with our father again, where he would be that voice with us walking in the midst of the garden. We lost that. And because of that, it has allowed for systems to come into play to confuse us. And we think that we're free but I'm going to tell you, when I hear conversations that come out of those who profess to have the faith and I hear the same rhetoric and I'm like, do you guys, are you, are, are you just theologians? Is that all you have or have you actually had an intimate experience with God where he showed you some things that were not necessarily on the pages of the Bible? And I'm not talking about doing hocus pocus pro prophetic stuff. I'm just talking about giving you insights into what's on the pages in a way that shows that you're in his mind and not just thinking like a theologian or thinking from another man's concept of who God is. I don't know if any of this is making sense. I, I hope I'm even staying true to this whole thing of being free, but let me bring it into our topic for today. We as a country say in words that we are established based upon biblical principles. But I would argue, why is it that the very biblical principles that we should be following are the ones that our government wants us to reject? Why is it that, that the, the founders of this country, flawed as they may be, they understood that they had to at least have things in place, rules in place that were greater than them. And they saw the Bible as the, uh, the manuscript in which to base these laws. I'm not saying that they lived these laws, but they based it upon the Bible. Well, our lives are supposed to be based upon the Bible as well. So how can you be a Christian and entertain LGBTQIA and plus and everything else. How can you be a Christian and how can you support abortion? How can you, how can you do it? How can you support many of the systems that this world has put in place unless you're still a slave to this world? I hope that makes sense. See, see God doesn't operate the way that, that we operate, not with the mentalities that uh, we operate in, but I, I wrote down some points of reference. I, I'm going to try to get back into my, my text here. But we've got to understand that, that the Bible has given us the roadmap to everything that we need to do 
all the decisions we need to make. And when we do things outside of God's will, we are always going to stumble and fall. So I brought up John chapter 8, verses 31 through 36. But in order to really do a deep dive, because again, we do not compartmentalize scripture. We put scripture into context. So I want to tell you why that was read. I want to tell you why I used it. And I want to tell you why when we get to the core of this message that I'm going to be dealing with the woman who was accused of adultery. I'm going to try to do that as quickly as possible. Give me about 20 and we'll get it done. All right. So points to keep in mind. Chapter 7 and 8 of John cover the beginning of the end of Jesus's public ministry. Point number two. Jesus openly challenges the spiritual errors of the Jewish leadership, particularly the Pharisees, mm -hmm. and boldly proclaims the part he plays in the salvation of mankind. All while there were plots for his murder being discussed behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. Point number three. At the time where chapter seven starts, and again, Really, you should go chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8. But I'm going to deal with chapter 7 because it's important to understand what was going on. All right. At the time where chapter 7 starts, they were celebrating the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot. Okay. And if you want to get a better understanding of what that is, um, go to Leviticus. Uh, chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. But I'm going to give you a little hint of what that is, because this is important to understand why Jesus says what he says when he says it. You see, we, we don't put any one verse on an island. We've got to do our homework, okay? So during this uh, Feast of, of, of Tabernacles or of Booths or Sukkot, during this festival, Israel gathered uh, <clears throat> uh, what they call lux luxuriant bows or, and they built booths, literally booths, in which to live for the span of the festival. And the festival was one week. These acts were meant to remind the children of Israel of their time spent wandering in the desert. Mm-hmm. Remember, that wandering in the desert came after being in bondage to Egypt, right? Okay. All right. So the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, is the last of the seven feasts described in the Pentateuch. That's the, the law of Moses. Starting four days after the Day of Atonement. I want you all to understand why things are said and the significance of why they're said contextually, all right? Day of Atonement, that is self-explanatory. The day when all Israel came together to be atoned by the high priest for their sins. That was a yearly uh, event in the life of the children of Israel, okay? It begins after the completion of grain threshing. In other words, that's the separating of the grain from the chaff, all right? And the pressing of grapes. And on the 15th day of Tishri, I think I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, which uh, happened in late September uh, to late October. So you're getting a sense of the time in which all of this is being done. So point number four is that Jesus criticizes the Jewish leadership for being hypocrites, living in arrogance, ignorance, and traditions for despising uh, uh, his despisement among uh, people, uh, or in other words, them despising him for performing miracles. 
again, think about what's going on here, the dynamic. Jesus is saying all kinds of things that go outside of Jewish belief in their holy festival, their holy week. See, see, everything is not just so cutting dry that, that you just had a bunch of guys that are just like hating on Christ, you know, just for the sake of hating on him. They really believed what they believed. And so when he's saying things and doing things that go against what they understand as the law, the Pentateuch, it's going to create an effect. I'm going to say this again. If you find people who are making proclamations mm. that go outside of just what you hear every Sunday, but these things are true to God, they're going to have problems. And I'm going to say this right now. There's a reason I don't get invited to many places because I'm not going to change my message in order to fit into the cookie cutter box that we have called the institutionalized church. I don't even see church like that. So, so this is what's going on. Then point number five, and this is the key. And this is where we're going to spend the remainder of our time. Jesus addresses the woman caught in adultery and her accusers. You'll find that in John 7, uh, starting at 7, uh, 53, and going to John 8, 11. That I will read for you. Okay. And in understanding what I'm getting ready to read to you, look at it this way. There were plots being talked about undercover for Jesus's murder. There was a, 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 a confusion that Jesus is coming with, let's just say a different kind of gospel and people were torn. And this created a lot of discussion among the Pharisees and scribes of that time. And they were just perplexed. But, the, the, but again, isn't it, so, isn't it incredible how they have a murderous intent, even in things they disagree with? Isn't that something that, that doesn't even follow the heart of God that would never want us to always have murderous intent? Even if we disagree with someone, we would try to work it out with that person as opposed to trying to plot their assassination, mm -hmm. which is what's going on. I think sometimes we sugarcoat things, how our Bible heroes, including Christ himself, were always under the, under the threat of being murdered and having to sometimes hide away and be stoled away mm -hmm. uh, for their own protection mm -hmm. because they refuse to compromise. All right. And so my man, Nicodemus, we always joke and say, Nick, Nick at night. Okay. <laughs> He's the same one that, yes, came to Jesus by night to just find out what does it mean to be born again, which is, a, again, a statement of freedom because you can't even be free unless you're born again. All right. Now, this same Nicodemus, he's the one that was making arguments to, uh, to the Pharisees to allow for at least fairness towards their hostility against Jesus. And to just be a reminder that, that, you know, even in a court system, the defendant, in this case, Christ, the defendant gets to be heard, at least before making sentence against him. All right? So I think it's the perfect lead-in to say that when we get to John 7, 53, it says, after all of this, Nicodemus, mm -hmm. Nicodemus stood up for Jesus. Of course, they rejected Nicodemus. And everybody else went to their own homes. All right? This is important. And, and I, I, I couldn't see it at first. And I was wondering, why did that, that one line, that, that's the last part of chapter 7, 
Why did it stand out as one single sentence and everyone went to his own house? And then when you pick up the first sentence in chapter eight, now we know that when it was originally written, none of this was in chapters. So this is just a continuation. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And my God, that is when I had the Holy Spirit revelation that it just messed me up because everybody else went home. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. So let me drop some stuff on you guys to let you know why I got excited about this. The Mount of Olives separates the Temple Mount, the most holy place in Judaism, from the Judean desert. Isn't that something? How you have holiness on one side, desert mm-hmm. on the other. Y'all know, understand what I'm talking about here? It's like, I, I can imagine people being in the, in the desert and seeing the mirage. And in the mirage, they see the, the holy temple. And they ch- keep trying to get to it, but it's just a mirage. Well, this is a, a literal line of demarcation that's for real. You had the temple mount, and then separate the separating was this uh, Judean desert. And we know it to be the place from which uh, Jesus ascended into heaven. We know that in Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 11. And it's also where he will return one day. So, so there's, there's a symmetry here. This is what makes the Bible come alive, y'all. All right. So we associate the Mount of Olives with Jesus. It's uh, where immediately after the final supper in the Garden of Gethsemane that he prayed to his father and was later arrested. He went there regularly with his disciples and often spent the night there. All right. The olives. Now, again, symbols, y'all. This is where you just don't read this stuff. That's why you don't speed read through the Bible. Mm. The olives from the mount represent peace. That's why you extend a what? Olive branch to someone. That is a sign of you're extending peace to make a situation that could be hostile. You bring peace by extending the olive branch. Jesus went to the place of peace, all right? And even here in the actual Mount of Olives, that the olives that were produced in this area were so much better than just the general population of olives that they were used solely for the anointing of kings and high priests. Well, doesn't it make sense that Jesus would go to the place that supports his priesthood and his kingship. That's why, I mean, I could could barely get off of uh, uh, chapter eight, verse one. I'm like, oh my God, this is what, oh my goodness. I was having, like, I was having a moment when I was going and preparing for all of this. I said, oh my gosh, it is so God that he gives us these little, little things these little points of reference that shows that he's so much greater than we are in every aspect. That's why we don't deny him. That's why we don't doubt him. You know, they had this song, uh, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. Well, the reason that people doubt him is because they don't know anything about him. See, but just right there, Jesus went to the place that could only be for him because He is the king forever. He is the high priest forever. Of course, this would be the place where he would go because he is holy. So what is the lesson before I finish this off? The lesson right there is when you find yourself in conflict with anyone, You don't have to fight that battle. Let them go to their own places and you go to the place, to the holy place, to the secret place 
of the Most High where you can abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Go to Psalm 91. Go to that place. Go to the place where he can restore you, where he can uh, complete you and give you the confidence to know that he is always God. I will never say still God. He's mm -hmm. always God. <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up. Oh, so let me continue. Um, ooh, boy. And John 8, at verse 2. Now early in the morning... He came again into the temple. So he went from his holy place of peace to the temple. And all the people came to him and sat down and taught them. And he taught them. And he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had sat there, uh, and when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now, I don't know if you guys have even thought about this. Now, he's in the mode of teaching. Is that the best time to bring someone who's caught in any sin? Have y'all thought about this? So, so you can understand that the enemy will throw all kinds of confusion Jesus is trying to teach kingdom and they are trying to justify their hatred towards a woman because of the letter of the law. Does that not sound like what we did to Tony Evans? That in the midst of whatever he may or may not be going through, that we've already made assumptions and have not gotten the whole story. Everybody is thinking what well, had to be this or it had to be that. And things are maybe coming out, but are they even accurate? Do, does it even matter what he did in the grand scheme of things when by whatever means he sat his own self down and said that he would actually be a participant in his own church that he created? Does that even make sense? And again, I didn't mean to go there, but hey, that's where it is. That's what we become. That's what we become. All right. So anyway, in verse five. Now, Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? So there's a challenge being made to him. You, you call yourself. I and the Father are one. You calling yourself, when you've seen the Father, you've seen me. Well, what do you have to say? And this is, oh my gosh. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. Mm -hmm. They're always accusing. Ain't that the devil? Always accusing. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though... He did not hear. Now, many times you will see that it will talk about that he drew a line in the sand. Okay. However, what was going on is significant that what he was doing there was actually drawing the line between righteousness and confusion righteousness and confusion and i'm telling you this is so brilliant that that it, it reminds me of when you know there had to be a decision made by solomon mm. as to who would uh be the mother of a particular baby and and Solomon says, what? <laughs> we'll just d divide the baby down the middle and you can each have a half, right? And of course, the real mother uh, gets exposed because, you know, 
No mother wants half a child. Okay. Anyway, I'm I'm going way off. Let me let me bring it in and close out here. So, anyway, Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, mm. key, let him throw a stone at her first. So now, in the same way that Solomon did many years ago, now the accusers became the ones being accused. All right? And so he then, again, stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, mm. went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the mist. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. I know that contextually, I don't think anybody has used this uh, passage to talk about independence and true freedom or to even ask the question, but are you free? Mm. But I'm going to tell you, that woman in that moment was free. Many believe that that woman was Mary Magdalene. You can argue it, but I, I tend to think it was her as well. If it was her, she went on to have an immaculate testimony about her devotion to Jesus that would last even at the cross. And so, and, and even after the cross for that matter. So, this is what we take away and then I'm, I'm done. I know I've been long. Um, these are my thoughts. Point number one. The accusers are those who follow the system of the world. They continuously make accusations about God and in many cases about God's people. And they force their ideas of freedom upon believers. This goes to the concepts of things that I know we've heard in our society. Oh, love is love. Mm. My body, my choice. Ah, oh, diversity, equity, inclusion, racism, Marxism, socialism, communism, social justice, pro-choice, pro-life, feminism, denominations, Democratic, Republican, etc., caste systems, Darwinism, Calvinism, Arminianism. These are systems, and there are many more, but, but these are systems. These are world systems. And when you see people that are calling themselves Christians arguing for one or the other, I think everybody's wrong. All right? The accused are God. Did you know that God was on trial? Mm -hmm. Did you know that you as a believer are also on trial? We who are believers ultimately believe that Christ is our ruler and high priest forever. Mm -hmm. The government that we support is God's, not man's. We answer to the highest of authorities, which is Christ rather than to the systems of men. Ultimately, we have been accused, all of us, of adultery against the father of lies, Satan. 
Did y'all know that we are the ones that are adulterous to our father for those of the world? Because Satan is the father of this world. And we who come against that, we're the adulterers because we are loving on the true and living God, not Satan. When the world is challenged to throw a stone, and that stone is always going to be full of hatred, that stone is always thrown ultimately at truth, real truth, and real truth is Christ. The world really can't make a substantial argument, and they'll simply depart and in fact, go to their own homes <laughs> for their own guilt and sin gets exposed. See, what does it say? Resist the devil and he shall depart. He shall flee. You resist the world system. It'll try you for a minute, but ultimately they'll let you go. Spew you out because the world cannot handle the truth. Sounds like Tom Cruise, right? You, or, or better yet, uh, uh, um, who's it, uh, Jack Nicholson. Oh. You know, you can't handle the truth. That's what's going on here, all right? <laughs> and then lastly, the believer is left being encouraged by God to go and live a life free from the bondage of sin and embrace the holiness and righteousness of God. That's it. So uh, as I, I'm... Closing out, um, I know that our attendance was down today as far as listeners are concerned. Um, praise God that uh, with Facebook Live, you can uh, catch us anytime you want to. But while we are having our burgers and hot dogs and whatever else you put on the grill, while we are shooting firecrackers and fireworks and having a good old time and celebrating an independence that's truly not an independence by the standards of God. Mm. Keep in mind that we all who believe answer to a higher authority. Amen. And that authority is Christ. And only when you answer to that authority and to that authority only can you experience true freedom? And that freedom is in Jesus Christ forever.